One second. Okay. Question three uh, continued. In fact, the, the man who was responsible for bringing me to Alaska, he, w he was trying to get a priest for the village and couldn't find a priest, so he settled for a seminarian, and that turned out to be me. Uh, he told me the story of how he, as an infant, born in Yuzinki, the village that's on Spruce Island, but eight miles west of Monk's Lagoon. Uh, he was born there as a child and came down precisely with pneumonia, and the doctors gave up all hope of his survival. But a few elders from the village, if they hadn't known St. Herman themselves, their parents or grandparents had known him. They were of the, in the habit, you could say, the tradition of visiting Father Herman's grave on a regular basis. They would go there and put flowers on, like people visiting the grave of their own relatives. And so they said, we'll go to Monk's Lagoon. And they brought earth from Father Herman's grave and water from the spring, and they anointed the, the baby, he was just less than a year old, I think. Uh, they anointed him with this dirt and mud, really, and within a day he recovered. The, the pneumonia left his body. He considers his whole life to be a miracle that he would attribute to the intercession of... See, this is something we should recognize in our church without embarrassment. We believe that God uses material means for his spiritual ends. Um, Christ spat on the ground and made mud and anointed the eyes of the blind man. And the blind man then washed at the pool and came back seeing. It's that kind of thing. If Jesus did this and he says, greater things than I, you will do. And so to find his disciples centuries later doing the same thing shouldn't really surprise us. Um, in any case, those who have visited Father Herman's gravesite over the years, time and again, have been healed of whatever diseases they had. Very much like the Pool of Siloam or the, uh, the Pool of Bethesda. There's certain places where the angel of God comes and stirs the water and whoever gets in first is healed of their disease. This has happened in Monk's Lagoon at Spruce Island probably hundreds of times, undocumented. Undocumented in the, um, and probably never written down by anybody, but the oral tradition has uh, pervaded those stories. Every, it's common knowledge. The, even the most fundamentalist or unbelieving, uh, fundamentalist Christian or unbeliever uh, around Kodiak could not deny the healing uh, presence of Father Herman's grave simply being among them. We should also acknowledge this as Orthodox Christians, that um, because God has used material means for spiritual ends, since the very beginning of Christianity, the Church has always gathered at the tomb of the saints, the, the uh, burial site of the martyrs. And to this day, the antimens on the altar used for the celebration of the liturgy, or in certain practices, the altar itself is a tomb. A relic of a martyr or saint is always placed at the center of Orthodox worship, in the altar table or in the antimens. So we're always, in a sense, gathering, like the ancient church did, at the tombs of the martyrs and gathering around the relics, the bones, the dry bones that will hear the word of the Lord, the dry bones of the saints. And we know from historical experience Holiness is almost like radiation. You go, to the, you go to the hospital for radiation therapy, the radiation, it, it's a kind of poison actually, but in small doses, it's curative. An overdose can be harmful. But we, in a sense, have the cer that certain sense about holiness itself. God's holiness would overwhelm us. God would love to embrace us, so to speak, but it would be too much for us to handle. So we need to get it in small doses. And in a certain sense, visiting the grave of a martyr or a saint is exactly the small dose. It's mediated by the bones of the saint, but somehow it radiates out and sanctifies us. And that's the sense the Aleut people had of the grave of St. Herman and the graves of the saints. In addition to that, of course, there's the holy water that's been blessed. And you can ask almost any Orthodox Christian, certainly again in Alaska, where people certainly believe that all holy water potentially cures, because holiness cures. It dispels what is evil and harmful and fills it with light and life. Um, some of the most extraordinary stories then about St. Herman are not about anything he did during his life. They're the miracles that occurred when people visited his gravesite and prayed there. And even 
prayed there on behalf of absent people who then from a distance were cured uh, within hours or days of their relatives having come on, beha on their behalf to Monk's Lagoon, to Spruce Island, and having prayed for Father Herman's intercession for their ailing friend or relative. So it, it extends even to those who, on behalf of others, have come and prayed. And, and that's so well known in the Kodiak area that it's like undisputable. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there are the miracles simply that occur when praying before the icon of the Mother of God of Sitka. It's, another, it's reputed to be a, a miracle working icon. Those who have been sick or have had even not, not necessarily physically sick with ailments, but emotionally and spiritually troubled have come before the icon and found those, that crisis in their life resolved. Uh, the stress that was in their life somehow alleviated. Uh, their emotional and spiritual condition improved by physical contact with this particular icon. God can use any icon he chooses. In fact, he can use the stones <laughs> if he needs to, but he especially has used historically in the history of our church icons of the Mother of God. It's not just her, of course, it's the icon of Christ in his mother's arms. But venerating these icons, and, and particularly in our case, the icon Our Lady of Sitka, which is Our Lady of Kazan in its uh, more recent portraiture version painted by a, a Russian portrait artist. It's not really done in an, in an iconographic, Byzantine iconographic style, but time and again people have prayed before this icon and been healed of their, of their spiritual as well as physical ailments. Um, this cross is also, has also been, in my experience, used by God several times to dispel disease. It, the, the cross itself was made by a student of mine whose father was a prominent church artist in Moscow. Vladimir Chernyshev uh, painted crosses, icons, uh, panagias for bishops uh, during his life, which ended in 1996. So in the 20 or 30 years before that, he was a prominent uh, iconographer who's whose name was well known, who's, about whom articles were published in magazines and newspapers, people throughout Russia knew him as a, this extraordinary iconographer. His son was sort of apprenticed to him late in his life, and Maxim, who was my student at the St. Tikhon Institute, was just learning to paint icons of this caliber when I met him. And I, I ministered, in a sense, to his father. During the Soviet era, it was forbidden for a priest to make house calls or even hospital visits. The, the ministry of a church of a priest was restricted to the interior of the church building. And even though it was a few years after the collapse of communism, the, the priests had not been trained, you could say, in being chaplains for hospitals or to make house calls or visit prisons, even though it was mandated by the gospel. They had been forbidden for so many years to do it. In a sense, maybe they just didn't know how but certainly they didn't feel comfortable. And being an American in, in Moscow during those years, I didn't have any problem with that. I'd been making hospital visits and such. Uh, so I met, I met Vladimir Chernyshev at his home. I prayed with him there. The night before his heart operation, I went to the hospital and prayed for him and with him there. Tragically, he died during that operation. After the funeral, I, made, I came to his house and, and attended the memorial meal and blessed the food. This was, at, in Russia at that time, something extraordinary, something unusual. So they very much, the family very much appreciated that. And unbeknownst to me, Vladimir told his son, Maxim, make a cross for Father Michael. And this is the cross he made with the saints of Alaska. And then because various bishops over the years had given me a, a tiny fragment of the relics of St. Herman and, then, and St. Innocent and later St. Tikhon, and a friend of mine from Japan, Father John Takahashi, had given me a relic of St. Nicholas of Japan. I placed all of those inside this cross. And several times I've had the experience of praying for someone, placing this cross on them as we said the prayers, and having that person, within hours or at the most days, cured of the disease that, that they, with which they were afflicted. Three of them were, were cancer patients who were assessed as terminally ill, who then received a kind of remission of that, of that cancer and survived for many years beyond. 
Most recently here on this trip, a woman who told me she had Lyme disease, which is very debilitating. I, I've known other people with this condition. Uh, she said that she felt the disease affecting her, her respiratory system, that she was having trouble breathing and she would, thought she would have to probably go to the hospital. Well, we said the prayer of, a, of anointing heavenly physician, healer of our souls and bodies, stretch forth thy hand of healing upon thy handmaiden through the prayers of St. Herman, St. Innocent, St. Tikhon, St. Nicholas of Japan, and she reported to me by email a few days later, uh, thank you for that prayer, Father, but the symptoms left within hours of, of that prayer. So God can do what he wants, as I said, he, but he uses the icons to let us know it's precisely because of these saints and their intercessions that he's answered the prayers and, and performed this miracle. He, he could use, you know, like I said, a stone, <laughs> But that wouldn't be as obvious. He wants us to know that it's through the intercessions of those saints and their, their holy relics, the sanctity that radiates from them, that, um, that this healing has occurred. And I, I wouldn't say it's something that I've been focused on in my ministry, but it is just something, by, in a sense, by default has happened. And we have to... I mean, that's why we have the crosses and the icons and, and why we venerate... We, spent, we discussed veneration earlier, where we treat holy objects with something more than just honor and respect. It's a notch higher than that, because we believe holiness radiates from them, and that holiness is powerful and can cure and transform lives.